Where we're going to start today is from verse 1, the first part of verse 1 from chapter 4, first part of verse 1 from Ecclesiastes. Again, I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears, look at the tears of those who are oppressed, they have no one to comfort them. I have a couple of other lessons I'm going to attach to this, and they're they're lesser known verses, uh, but I want to kind of drive home the point just to start the message out this morning. So the next verse is this, life is unfair. The sooner you accept it and learn to adapt your expectations, the better off you will be embracing the opportunities that God has given and will continue to give you. That is PJ's letter to the Royal Redeemers, Pastor Jeff. So that is me, is chapter 2, verse 1. I can humbly tell you the stuff in chapter 1, pretty good, okay? Uh, And if you invite me to come back, maybe I'll, I'll share those verses with you as well. There's just one more verse, and it's a little bit shorter, uh, and it actually might determine whether or not you want me to come back. So, life is unfair. Get over it. That is my letter to my personal children and to the students I teach uh, and work with at Lutheran West. That's chapter one. That's verse one. That's right out the gate. There's no messing around. Life is unfair. Get over it. Uh, the truth is, though, I wouldn't, you wouldn't have to teach children that life is unfair. It's, it's just something that, that just is. It's something that we experience. And truly, if somebody came up to you and tried to convince you, tried to tell you, no, no, life is actually pretty fair. Our experiences would quickly nullify those efforts. The truth is that bad people get away with doing bad things, and that makes life unfair. In fact, the lack of justice can give the impression that it's okay to do whatever we want. And so from the 8th chapter, the 11th verse of Ecclesiastes, when a crime is not punished quickly, people feel that it's safe to do wrong. People feel like it's safe to do wrong. Now, I appreciate our justice system in America. It has its flaws, it has big flaws, it has, has little flaws, but overall, I think it's, it's a pretty good justice system, and luckily, I have not had that much personal interaction with it. But I cannot tell you how many times I've had this thought. I don't know why it's taking so long for this person or why it's taking so long for that person to be held accountable for their actions. Just give me five minutes with them. Nobody around, no cameras, and I will administer justice right now. And this unfairness is not limited to our courts. It's not as if uh, criminals are the only ones who make life unfair. It seems to affect each and every facet of life. So the Bible, just in Ecclesiastes, has something to say about this. It has something to say about our personal relationships, our, our professional, uh, civic relationships, and very rarely does equality exist in our relationships. And I need to say, that's not inherently a bad thing. There needs to be different levels of authority or status in mer- many areas in which we live and we work. So... I love my kids. I love my kids. I have uh, a 21-year-old daughter named Grace. I have a 16-year-old son. Stand up, please. His name is Ben. Don't clap. Don't clap. No, don't clap. Sit back down. Don't clap for him. And I love my kids. I respect my kids. I want them to grow up to be strong individuals. But as much as I love them, I outrank them. I simply do. I've had to remind my kids something that my dad told me, and I admit it, when my dad told me this, I thought it was one of the most unfair things I'd ever heard in my entire life. But I tell my kids, you cannot win an argument against me that I want to win. You can't. Even when I'm wrong, I'm still right. Now, that same logic does not apply to my relationship with my wife, but that's a completely different relationship. 
And I despised it when my dad told me that. But you know what? He was right. That di- these dynamics exist for a good reason, for, for leaders and followers and bosses and employees and teachers and students, parents and, and children. There needs to be these structures. They're not bad in and of themselves, but because there is a difference... Bad things can happen in our relationships. So people are taken advantage of by those who have more power than them. People are taken advantage by those who have more power than them. And we're going to go back to that first verse that we saw. We'll see the whole verse now. Again, I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them. They have no one to comfort them. And I want to point out the one word that should tell us everything that we need to know about how persistent it is that life is unfair. Again, we're only four chapters in to Ecclesiastes, and and it's being said, look, again, this unfairness is not something new. It's not, uh, it's not temporary. It's not something that's relegated to the past. It's not something that's never going to darken our door again. Unfairness is something that simply exists in our everyday relationships. And as I said at the beginning, we can look at how this plays out in a lot of different ways, okay? So politicians, and I'm going to read this one exactly as I wrote it. Politicians. It's actually not safe for me to write more after that word. (laughs) But the ugly truth is that regardless of which side of the aisle we are on, politicians and justice, those two words, are not two words that we would often connect. I I enjoyed that line a little too much. I lost where I was. Okay. (laughs) So God wants us to to pray for our government leaders. God wants us to pray for them. And and while I cannot say this with uh, absolute certainty, I think at least part of the reason that God wants us to pray for our government leaders is because they contribute to the unfairness in the world. They need our prayers not just to protect them, but to guide them and to help save them from the mistakes that they are going to make. So Ecclesiastes also tells us this. If you see oppression of the poor and perversion of justice and righteousness in the province, don't be astonished at the situation. Because one official protects another official and higher officials protect them. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 8. Don't be astonished. Don't be surprised. So this wisdom from Ecclesiastes is thousands of years old, and some people would think we would have worked out this whole problem by now. And yet here we are. Now we also need to acknowledge that this unfairness is not limited to bad people doing bad things. It also happens when we do the right thing. Good people often go unrewarded. Good people often go unrewarded. Here's something that happens all the time and makes no sense at all. Good people get what's coming to the wicked and bad people get what's coming to the good. I tell you, this makes no sense. Chapter 8, verse 14 of Ecclesiastes. Even if we prepare ourselves to do everything quote-unquote right, we often still fall short from no wrongdoing on our part. And this one seems to be more perverse than the previous examples. Because the truth is, when a bad person does something bad, are we surprised? Hold on one second. When a bad person does something bad, are we surprised? It's just what they do. But when we do the right thing and we don't get rewarded, or when the bad person gets the good results, that is completely unfair. I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. 
And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It's all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. Accepting that much of life is based on chance or luck, it goes against our American mantra of you can do or be whatever you want to be. Now, I love my parents. They told me when I was little I could be whatever I wanted to be. They lied to me. And if our efforts do not result in success, then life seems to be truly unfair. Now, I need to change things up a, a bit here because all these examples that I've shared, um, the ones I've shared so far, they all have one common trait, and that is they all concern the, the outward things in life or the things that we perceive that other people do to us or that they get instead of us getting them. And so up to this point, this view of unfair is where we're the victims, but what about all the ways that we make life unfair for others? You see, I wanted to start off nice. I wanted to say, hey, look at all those people, how horrible they are, how they make your life unfair. Because I wanted to get on your good side. Okay? And I hope I did because the sermon's about to take a turn. All right? This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 19 from The Message. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and list the various sins that I've committed in my life for two reasons. One, I don't love feeling ashamed about myself. Two, we have nowhere near enough time necessary for me to list even a portion of them. And I'm not going to stand up here and try to guess at the different sins that all of you have committed, people sitting in this room or watching at home. You see, we've concocted this, this idea that we have these secret sins and these secret sins that we have, they don't hurt other people. And I'll let you believe that. It's wrong. I want to be clear. It's wrong. But for the purposes of this sermon, I'm, I'm going to let it slide. But I want us to look at how we create unfair relationships, how our sins do result in injustice for others. Now, if you didn't know this, you're gonna, uh, you might either really like this or you might not. I don't know. Lutherans do some amazing things with our theology. We are brutally honest about our sin. We can take something that seems really, really good in every human light and show that how it's at the very least flirting with sin. Simple question. Don't raise your hand. It'll throw me off. Simple question, how many actions do you think you do that are completely done for the benefit of another person, a group, a community, a nation, or the world? How many of your actions are truly, solely just for the benefit of somebody else? You see, motivation that is self-serving, that, that knowingly makes us look good to other people or increases our social standing or is done with strings attached or is just done because we want to make ourselves feel good about ourselves, those are all sinful. So if I know that, hey, I'm going to go volunteer at the uh, indoor rummage sale uh, at the church, but I know I'm going to go do that because if I show up, someone's going to be like, wow, Pastor Jeff volunteered. He must be a great guy. And if I do it for that reason, that action is sinful. If I strive to be the best husband that I can be, if, if I do extra chores around the house without being asked, but I do it 
because I want my wife to let me go out and have a couple beers with friends or because I forgot our anniversary. I've never done that. I want somebody to write that down in a little sheet. But if that's the reason I did it, then my motivations are sinful. If I do a favor for a friend, and the reason I do the favor for the friend is because I know in a few months I'm moving and I need their truck, then I've created an unfair and sinful situation. Now, it does not matter that the people at the rummage sale are going, wow, it's fantastic you're here. It doesn't matter that my wife is thrilled that I'm doing extra things around the house. It doesn't matter that my friend is just excited that I'm there in that moment doing that favor for him. All these things in the world goes, wow, that makes you a good person. If my motivation is to just make myself better, it's all sinful. So why... Does God allow this to happen? Why does God allow sin just to run and and unfairness to run rampant through society? I mean, wouldn't life be so much easier if God simply didn't allow for sin to exist? And I'm going to answer that with with two answers. First, we'll never know necessarily this side of the final judgment. Sin is here. It's in the world. It's a moot point. But second, I trust that God knows what he's doing. And I think there's a good reason for it. This is a question you can't answer, whether in unison, individually, I don't care. Do you want love to exist? Does any, all right, let me rephrase. Does anybody not want love to exist? Well, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. I didn't even tell them to highlight that. They just did that, and that's awesome. Because God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And then look, today I'm giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. God is giving us the free will, the choice. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. You see, in order for true love to exist, we need the option to say no. God is pure love. The Holy Trinity voluntarily and faithfully say yes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three are one. But if we lack the ability to tell God, no, I don't want a relationship with you, then we could not voluntarily and faithfully say to God, yes, I do want a relationship with you. And so the other side of that free will is this, through the gift and necessity of free will, God does not create injustice. However, the ability for life to be unfair comes into existence. The ability for life to be unfair, it comes into existence. And another reason that it exists is endurance produces character, proven character, and proven character produces Hope, Romans 5, 4. Now, the way this applies is this. It's true that at times God blesses us with certain and specific gifts. But it's just as true that God gives us opportunities to use our gifts and our talents to grow in our own faith and to grow in our relationships. And so many times probably way more than we would prefer, those opportunities appear to be challenges or obstacles, things we would rather not experience. So God says to us, look, you want this? Okay. You want this? Okay. Here's what it's going to take to get there. And there are many experiences that I've had in my life that I would rather have not had. I would have rather not had them, and yet they were God-given lessons. Now, does that mean even knowing that, if I had experienced them all over again and experienced that pain and that that sadness and loss, would I want to do it again? Probably not. But at times, the things that we view as unfair are part of God's plan to prepare us or get us to where we need to be. So not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Ecclesiastes 7.20. 
I know we're, most of us are familiar with uh, in the New Testament, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But even back here in Ecclesiastes 7.20, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. I apologize for a second. I'm Lutheran, but I tell people I sweat like a Pentecostal, so I'm going <laughs> to wipe my head off. Now, up to this point, everything that I've discussed could be framed as either being fair or unfair, right or wrong, good or bad, godly or sinful. But we all know that, that life and events and experiences, they refuse to be categorized so easily that they, they object to being put into a single column. And so unfairness even goes into those spaces. When those times arrive... And, and they show themselves, how do, we defi- uh, excuse me, how do we define what is fair and unfair? Can we? So I have an example that I want to share this morning. So when I was in seminary, I served uh, my chaplaincy at The Ohio State University's medical center, so in their hospital, and I was assigned to a couple of floors. And on the eighth floor, uh, there was someone that uh, was there in her room the first day I got there for my chaplaincy, and she was there the last day I was there for my chaplaincy, and she'd been there every day up to that point. And she'd actually been in her room for about seven months prior to me getting there. And her name was, uh, is uh, Monique. Monique was in her early 30s. She was a mother of three. She was married. But she'd been in the hospital, like I said, when I got there for about seven months and was there for at least nine months by the time I left. And the reason Monique was there was because Monique had something with, uh, wrong with her heart and she needed a heart transplant. And so there were many times when I would visit with Monique and we would have a discussion that centered around something like this. She would say, I know that in order for me to live and to be with my family, I need somebody else to die. She said, I don't know how I'm going to deal with that when it happens. I'll be so happy that I have a new lease on life and a new chance to be able to watch my children grow up and to be with my husband and, and just to, to experience life. But I don't know how I'm going to work through the, the reality that in order for me to have all those things, somebody else had to give up all those things. And when we run into those situations like that, How do we say, look, it's obviously this side is right and this side is wrong. This side is good, this side is bad. When we come into situations in life where it just doesn't seem to be one or the other, we can question, why, God, do you allow this to exist? And what I'll tell you is, it exists... And it shows us that no matter how good of a life we live, we need a Savior. So when I come to the truth that no matter how hard I try, let me go back a second. Now, no matter how hard I try, I cannot control everything in my own life, let alone all the pain, the suffering, and the sin that's in the world. When I acknowledge that, I fall down at the cross of Christ. And I ask for the healing and salvation that I cannot accomplish on my own. And so God knows that it happens, and God gives us a Savior. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. You see, even after we work through all of the various ways that life is unfair, whether it's uh, another person's fault or it's based solely on our own actions or our inactions, we arrive back at the simple fact that we started off with, life's unfair. 
And it's unfair because our sin wreaks havoc on this beautiful creation that God has placed us in. And it does so, it does it so thoroughly that we contribute to injustice at times without even knowing it. We have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And yet Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And because of that glorious truth that we proclaim, we can say this. The beauty of grace is that it makes life unfair. From a Reliant K song. Now, in full transparency, the line is actually the beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. But I did not intentionally, with a little tongue-in-cheek, make every answer unfair uh, in that outline just to make the last one say not fair, okay? So, the beauty of grace is that it makes life unfair. When we absolutely ruin the world that God has lovingly created, when we hurt and destroy the relationships in which we are blessed to be, when our sin makes life unfair, God has an answer. Jesus said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 30. See, I do not deserve God's forgiveness. You do not deserve God's forgiveness. No one deserves God's forgiveness. Thank you, God, that your grace makes life unfair. Let us pray. Lord, we humbly come before you acknowledging the various ways that we fall short. We fall short and we try and sometimes when we try we make things a little better but often many other times we still make things worse. And, and yet even through all of those times when we mess things up, you still stay there with your arms outreached beckoning us to you and letting us know that you have that you have given your all, that you've given your life voluntarily and faithfully to take away the sin of the world. Lord, we ask that you would help us to share that message of salvation and forgiveness, of love and grace with all those we meet, whether or not we think they deserve it. This is our will, Lord, let your will be done. And we offer this prayer in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about Royal Redeemer. We want you to be a part of our Royal Redeemer family here. May God richly bless you and guide you, and I truly look forward to seeing you soon.